Shalom. I'm Rabbi Alicia Magal at the Jewish community of Sedona and the Verde Valley here in Arizona. And this is a class on Jewish art. What is Jewish art? We will look at some of the challenges throughout the ages of creating art that we would consider Jewish. And we'll ask some questions about what makes art Jewish. We're going to be concentrating on visual arts. I mean, we can't do everything with uh, music and theater and film and uh, sculpture. I mean, just so many possibilities. And we'll only touch on some of the key figures and uh, movements in Jewish art. So again, these are some of the questions we'll be asking. We'll look at holy architecture and ritual objects such as menorahs, eternal lights, the arcs that we have in, in our sanctuaries, and some of the beautiful manuscripts that illustrated our Haggadah for Passover or Megillat Esther for Purim with a lot of attention to the illustration and the calligraphy. Uh, Ketubot, the marriage certificates, uh, have various styles throughout history, but the wording, until just recently, was really all the same. And we've always wanted to illustrate biblical stories, uh, and there were differences in how Jews showed biblical stories and, char and characters, um, other, other than how Christians and um, other artists portrayed them. We'll look at a depiction of Jewish life cycle rituals that stand out and just beg to be uh, portrayed in paintings. Of course, in our day, we do a lot of photography, but throughout history that had to be painted or sketched to record them. Uh, our wonderful holiday celebrations led to very colorful illustrations as well. And in our day, modern paintings uh, flourished, sculpture, uh, installation art, and of course, uh, the wider scope of all kinds of arts. We've been very well represented throughout the ages. So let's dive in. Uh, we know that the second commandment prohibits making a likeness of what is in the heaven above, on the earth below, the waters under the earth. So what does that mean? But remember, there's another sentence that comes after. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. In other words, these are not gods as the idols of other um, populations and cultures had. So was it that you couldn't make the image or just you couldn't make it to bow down to them? This was the big question. Well, let's look back in history in the Torah about what we consider the first artist. His name was Bitzalel. Bitzalel in the shadow of God. So the first artist was the one who took the idea the description that Moses received from God, but Moses was not able to turn it into something concrete, but Salel was. And he possessed such great wisdom that he could combine those letters of the alphabet with which heaven and earth were created. And uh, he was considered to have wisdom and knowledge from the Holy One. He succeeded in erecting a sanctuary, which was to be the Mishkan, the abiding place for God. And uh, this Mishkan, this tabernacle, uh, contained so many beautiful objects. So the candlestick was very complicated. Moses couldn't comprehend it, even though God twice showed him a heavenly model. But when described to Bezalel, <clears throat> he understood immediately, and he was able to transform it into gold and something that the people could see and use. And uh, Moses expressed his admiration for Bezalel, 
saying that he must have been in the shadow of God when the heavenly models were shown to him. Um, but Salel owed, owed his wisdom um, to the merits of his pious parents. And, uh, you know, his grandfather was Hur and the great grandmother Miriam. So he was thus a grand nephew of Moses. Uh, many of us who've been to Jerusalem know about the Bezalel Academy of Arts and Design, which was founded all oh, back in about 1906 um, because they wanted to have uh, a truly Jewish and Israeli uh, academy for teaching art. And indeed, they have created a national style of art for the Jewish homeland. Later, once the Israelites settled and uh, once there were kings, um, Solomon was able to expand the template of the tabernacle into a fixed place, the temple from the, about the 10th century to the 6th. And then after destruction, Herod rebuilt and expanded the second temple uh, so that it was glorious and the site of pilgrimages for all those centuries. Indeed, the Talmud describes the beauty of the second temple saying, he who has not seen the temple in its full construction has never seen a glorious building in his life from the Talmud Tractate Sukkot. So let's look at some of the objects from ancient times that have become symbols for the Jewish people, such as the menorah. So you can see that there's something called knobs and cups, and it looks like a plant. It looks like um, a very organic growing plant plant with uh, flowers and uh, a stem and roots. And in fact, there is such a plant that grows in Sinai. I remember discovering it when I was a tour guide and going, my God, it looks just like a menorah. And then it became more stylized and depicted in various um, designs, sometimes rounded and sometimes just uh, with these diagonals. Um, and they were kindled every night by the priests. Of course, it was olive oil. And the three on each side pointed to the middle. And from the middle, uh, the light would come forward. It became a symbol for Jews throughout the ages. You can even see a depiction of menorahs um, and other implements from the temple in uh, the synagogues that existed in the north in the Galilee. Uh, again, it often was shown to look like a tree or be surrounded by a tree, hearkening back to the tree of life, also to the burning bush, the idea that it was um, very living, very organic, and that it gave light. Uh, in contemporary times, we see that there is a menorah um, in front of the Knesset, the parliament in Jerusalem, that was, um, it has many depictions of biblical stories and history on it since uh, 1956 when it was donated and put in front of the Knesset. It even is the logo, logo for the Union for Reform Judaism in a very stylized manner, but very recognizable. Many, many congregations have some kind of a menorah that is lit. And again, we're talking about a seven branched candlestick, one for each day of the week. And uh, the, the uh, very important symbolism of seven. We at the Jewish community of Sedona and the Verde Valley are blessed to have a large menorah sculpted by Skip Fox of blessed memory at the entrance as you just come into our um, building. And uh, sanctuary art has developed many, many forms. So you could have even this very stylized one that looks like um, people raising their arms and becoming the light from uh, the outside of um, this synagogue in Tennessee. 
Well, we're very familiar not only with menorahs, but what we call Hanukkah menorahs or Hanukkiot. And they may look different from different countries, but they all will have nine spots for either oil or candles, eight for each day of uh, lighting the, the menorah, and one, the shamash, the helper candle. This uh, example here is from Italy, and it's called a bench style because they're all in one line. And they, um, this is another bench style from Eastern Europe. And uh, you can see the double eagle, the crown of Torah. And this one has double duty because it can also hold Sabbath candles on each side. Many of us have a traditional brass Hanukkah. Perhaps a grandmother brought it over from Europe, uh, or you found one here, but this is a very traditional tree style. So there's a bench type and a tree model, and this is the tree model. And this one even looks like a tree, and um, they're not all in the same level, um, but it does the job. It's got for candles, it has uh, the shamash and the candles for each night of Hanukkah. Um, they could be in many, many different forms. I mean, this this one by Reuven um, Maisel has uh, replicas of famous synagogues throughout the world, and in front of it, a space for the candle, as if we are lighting on Hanukkah all over the world, and they have the models of synagogues themselves. Or they could be extremely contemporary, like this Agayov aluminum style that spells out ha nu ka even with the dagesh here with the dot in the kaf very modern style but the same function so we have form and function and the form can be different but the function is the same this is called the liberty hanukkah menorah by anson and uh it proclaims the dual qualities and values of American freedom with the theme of freedom in the Hanukkah story. Here you see models of the Statue of Liberty holding up a torch, which becomes the holder for the candles, and the American Eagle. This was part of the Americana um, exhibit that we had at the Skirball Museum, um, and it was, uh, it made people think. It was a celebration of American and Jewish traditions, and really almost made people sort of smile to say, oh, we can combine American and Jewish values, and that's exactly what this particular Hanukkah does. Let's go back to uh, the depictions of elements from the temple that were shown in other ways, like mosaics in the synagogues in the Galilee. They reflected the style of Greek and Roman art, but adapted to synagogue. So you can see uh, the knobs and cups in the menorah, the shofar, um, the, and other examples of art that suddenly you see depictions of human forms and the zodiac because the Hebrew calendar is very aware of each month and its energy and uh, since each you know the style of the time influenced the um, artistry of the mosaic floors here again, you see the zodiac sign, but um, these these particular characters look pretty primitive because the story is that um, they wanted very much to um, copy the fancy mosaics, but couldn't afford uh, the main artist. So they, they got his assistant and you can see these lions here look more like cats and everything is, is pretty flat and doesn't have the artistry of the um, 
mosaic artists who, who trained probably in Rome, uh, but they're still beautiful. And uh, again, you see the shofar, the menorah, um, a kind of tree, uh, maybe a, like a lulav. Um, there's um, somewhere an incense holder. There's all kinds of different examples. And you have the doors of, of the ark. Now, um, they were far from Jerusalem. You see, they were up in the Galilee, and it was far from Jerusalem. So synagogues started to be built even while there was a temple. And then once the temple was destroyed, the synagogues came uh, into their uh, much more importance. Um, here you see from Beit Shan very clearly the uh, mosaic of the columns of the temple, the incense pan, the shofar, the menorah. And um, this so inspired people in our time that this design was recreated uh, from Beit Sha'an in a contemporary chapel at Temple Emmanuel of Beverly Hills. Some of it is um, covered by this hoop-up for a wedding, but you can see that they've used the same design. Uh, I led services many times in this chapel, and um, this was just a beautiful use of ancient design in a contemporary setting. So manuscripts were illuminated to enhance the beauty of sacred text. What does that mean to enhance the beauty? It's called Hidur Mitzvah. And it comes from Exodus 15, 2. This is my God, and I will, how shall we say, enshrine, lift up, uh, decorate, just exalt, you know, all these verbs, meaning I'm going to show how much I care by how I do the mitzvah. So not just to um, say a prayer, but say it with kavanah, with intention. Uh, and every mitzvah can be exalted in this way. Hidur mitzvah. Such as uh, Megillat Esther. Here's a Sephardic scroll. And let's look at the beautiful illumination of Haman leading Mordechai on a horse through the town, honoring him. Each scene uh, just so beautifully described, as well as the calligraphy. Here's a medieval Haggadah, and you may be surprised to see the care with which the calligraphy is executed here. Lefichach. You know, it's, it's just decorated. And so the calligraphic arts were very, very honored, and it was a big deal to be a scribe. Here you see the bird's head Haggadah. They didn't want to show people, so they gave them uh, bird's heads. Um, and sometimes looking almost like a, like a midi, you know, like a griffin, something not quite human. Um, it was created in the Upper Rhine region of southern Germany, oh, around 1300. And um, there are miniatures and marginal vignettes throughout that Haggadah. It's the earliest surviving illustrated German Haggadah manuscript, which has the blessings, biblical passages, commentaries, psalms, and also instructions for conducting the Seder in, um, in Passover. You can just see how how beautiful this um this most illustrated of books can be now when we pray the amida we turn to the east there are several prayers in which we always pray to the east so it became a kind of custom to put a Mizrah, which means east, um, on the eastern wall, either at home or in the synagogue, because not all synagogues 
could be oriented toward the east. Sometimes you had to get up and turn to the right or the left, depending on the architecture. So the Mizrach would sort of take you out of time and space to the temple or to a place of meditation, like on the yud he vav he name of God, and uh, with micrography, with small writing of psalms in the shape of a menorah, in the shape of blessing hands. So um, these are just beautiful illustrations of a Mizrach. Now the Arba Turim, which means four columns, organized halacha into four columns. A column is a tour. And it actually, uh, the name comes from the column of stones in the high priest's breastplate. And in it were laws of prayer, holidays, marriage, divorce, finances. They had to sort of say, bottom line, these are the rules. Um, and this is from 14th century France and Spain. And the same organization of the Arba Turim um, was adapted to the Shulchan Aruch, which helped people understand, bottom line, what are the rules without all the commentary and discussion that you find in the much longer Talmud. Here's an illustration of uh, Jacob blessing Ephraim and Menashe. You see him crossing his hands so that the younger gets the right hand blessing and the older gets the left hand. Um, many times there were these beautiful uh, miniatures and slowly people were expressing what they wanted to say um, with actual people being depicted. So again, the Haggadah is the most illustrated Jewish text. This is from the Shik Haggadah. And there is a commentary on the Shik Haggadah that shows how um, this was done in the, in the 30s, how there were certain digs against Nazism and for the um, heroism of the Jews. He even shows the four sons as four types of people. Uh, the um, the chacham looks like the the wise one is a is a student. The uh, the simple one is kind of a glutton. You see, he's kind of fat and sort of hands upraised to say, "Well, I I don't really um, care about anything." The um, the rasha, the evil one, is dressed like a hunter. Um, adopting the customs of the, uh, the the people around, but not Jewish. And Enoyo de Elishol, the one who doesn't even know, he's dressed sort of like a peasant, uh, as if he hasn't done any learning, and he's out with his heavy boots um, outside and his hands in his pocket, very rough. Um, the, uh, the plagues are beautifully illustrated, and... Uh, it's worth it's worth really looking at the Shik Haggadah for its little hints of um, of history as it was meant to be in that time. Um, I love looking through it because each each portrait is just so expressive. So. This Hidur mitzvah idea of having beautiful objects to carry out a mitzvah um, can be seen in Polish Kiddush cup or a Yemenite silver Kiddush cup of a different style. The Torah crown and finials um, with their filigree. Havdalah spice boxes for Havdalah. But the truth is, you could have a very simple bottle of um, spices. So why do we go to the trouble and expense of making it in beautiful silver or even decorated um, as this Emmanuel spice box is because of Hidur Mitzvah? Sure, you could use a Dixie cup. Sure, you could do everything with plain plates for, for Passover but we want to make them beautiful, which shows our effort and our care. Hidur mitzvah. Another reason why we see such a wide range of styles is adaptation retention. That's the concept of fulfilling a mitzvah, but adapting it to the style and form of wherever Jews lived, the era and the location. 
So Hanukkah menorahs are one example, and ketubot, the marriage contracts, are another. While the actual text for many, 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 many centuries was exactly the same until the contemporary ones where you have more of a choice, it was really about acquiring uh, a wife and uh, protecting her so that in case of divorce, she had certain rights and she would be taken care of. So the text was the same. The rabbis formulated this basic clause of the contract. Oh, in the Talmudic period, um, incorporating provisions uh, which were composed as early as the first century. Now the text is written in Aramaic, which was understood by most people during that period. And the contract is signed by two witnesses. Um, and the earliest illustrated ketubot that have come down to us are from Venice from the 16th and 17th centuries. And this was the result of the refugees coming from the Spanish peninsula um, in Sephardi weddings, the ketubah was both a legal and a social function. The contract was displayed and read aloud at the wedding, which we still do today. And they also had uh, tenaim, which was specific conditions to each couple and written alongside. Um, so the groom agrees not to take a second wife. If the groom dies, the bride is paid the dowry from the estate. There were all these protections for the wife. Now, let's see how they looked. Very, very different. They had the same language, but different translations and decorations. As we look at these two ketubot, we see a style that is Persian, that hearkens to those miniatures and to um, very decorative style, floral style. And in the one here on the right, you see a rising sun and a lion. That is the symbol of Isfahan in Persia. So the text is the same as, let's say, it would be in Europe, but with local art elements. Here we have um, Italian ketubot, one that's um, 18th century and one that's inspired by it, but is much more contemporary. Um, and they often resemble manuscript pages, um, like, like a title page that invites the reader into the text. Uh, so in the ketubah at the left, a symbol arch, like a gateway, is supported by two Corinthian columns and it frames the text. Uh, and maybe that symbolizes the bride and groom's entry into an, a new life together. There's always a lot of symbolism in these ketubot. It's decorated with a border of uh, flowers and birds. And at the top, there's a butterfly. And below that, a wreath of flowers with a star of David at the center. You can see that right at the top here. In the center of the star is a depiction of how the hands are arranged when giving the priestly blessing. And uh, and the inscription says um, Mazel Tov Simon Tov with a good sign and favorable fortune for the bride and groom and all Israel Amen. And at the bottom of the text, you see the signatures of the two official witnesses, and um, that was from uh, the seventeenth late late seventeenth century, uh, early eighteenth. Basimana, Basimana, and in Aramaic here, Simintovu Mazeltov. You can see the columns and the text is in the middle. And let's do a close up here and see elements from the uh, tabernacle. You see the laver and the menorah. But what else do you see? You see symbols of the zodiac there's the, the twins and the crab and the zodiac when you say simon tobu mazel tov you're saying under a good constellation a mazal is really a constellation and here you have eshet chayel a terid bala of uh, a woman of valor the crown of her husband so that there, there's words all the way around that uh, enhance the the text which will be in the middle of that uh, beautiful ketubah. Let's look at some contemporary ketubot. Again, um, the language has evolved somewhat, but the translations and the decorations have really evolved. So you have an eternity, a heart, 
you have a tree that also has roots and the language has become more uh, egalitarian and contemporary rather than acquiring a wife it's more nurturing one another emotionally spiritually intellectually you see it's much more egalitarian we continue to grow together maintaining the courage and determination to pursue our desired paths this is very different also here the rabbi also signs and the bride and groom as well as the witnesses um, and that was more modern um, when i was at yitzhak's kibbutz Malgan michael um, my kibbutz mother had several children and nomi teplo was one of them she since moved to northern california and she creates these absolutely gorgeous kutubot, and I got her permission to share them with you. Nomi Teplo, you can look her up, a beautiful website. And again, she has the, uh, the text in the middle and the decorations all around, like Ein Gedi Spring, the Pillars of Home, and a Jerusalem courtyard. Some of them are even more contemporary such as this in a Judaica gallery that says, Ani le dodi ve dodi li, I am my beloved, my beloved is mine, or this Adventures of a Lifetime, again, where the decoration has um, really is prominent and the language is kind of at the bottom, but of course, uh, there's room for signatures and to be framed. Very often it gives an Eden-like idealized vision of what married life can be like, intertwined trees, um, just gorgeous. And not only on the ketubah, but also the chuppah, which originally was just a, a talit stretched above the couple. But here you see it very, very decorated. And um, this is another example of a chupa of the um, marriage canopy. All of these are examples of hidur mitzvah. The wording would have been enough, a simple talit would have been enough, but no, we go that extra distance to make it beautiful. Um, when I was the museum educator at the Skirball Museum, we had a whole uh, collection of wimples that were created um, as a custom in Bavaria, it spread to other parts of Germany, spread to Austria, Switzerland, Holland, Denmark, and German Jewish immigrants bought the custom to the United States and to Israel. So after a boy's Brit Milah, a female relative would decorate the cloth that had bound the child, like the, um, the uh, swaddling cloth, and create a long, long, long binder sewing it together and decorating it with the child's hebrew name the birth date jewish symbols and these wimples were brought to the synagogue to bind the torah on the child's first visit symbolizing his binding to the torah as a covenant you know it was the circumcision then it would be used at the bar mitzvah and then at the ufruf of his wedding because uh, there is that blessing at the bris where we say um, may this child have a life of Torah, chupa, and ma'asim tovim, study loving relationship and good deeds. So you can see all the decorations. And sometimes there would be um, the, the Hebrew date, Dalit of Tammuz, and the year. And sometimes a play on words, like maybe part of the name was Wolf, because here you have Red Riding Hood, and the wolf, sometimes they're very fanciful, and sometimes they were painted, sometimes embroidered, but uh, here you can see Shmuel ben Yaakov, um, Nolad le Mazal Tov, Biyom Shabbat, so they, they, there's a menorah, um, and many decorations, uh, very unique, very beautiful, and they're starting to do this in many congregations in the United States. And my question to all the people was, um, what Jewish art do you have? Do you have your ketubah? Do you have a home blessing on the wall? Uh, do you have a collection of menorahs or haggadot? 
And then, you know, what is high art that that might be worth millions or thousands? And what is just sort of memorable for you and makes you happy and is decorating your walls? So we're moving now to the second stage of this class, which is about um, Renaissance and the world of modern art and looking at more and more contemporary Jewish artists. And we'll see how in more contemporary times, Jewish art has changed. As history moved on, mostly the art was limited to construction of synagogues, the illustration of manuscripts, as we saw, and beautiful ritual objects. Why? Well, one is that there was a strong Muslim influence, especially in Spain um, and in the Arab uh, countries where Jews lived where um, there was much less physical representation, representation of any human forms, and people were influenced by the style where they lived. Now, in Northern Europe, there were very strong church controls, and Jewish communities desired not to draw attention. Their synagogues had to be lower than the churches, and they were very modest from the outside, um, and... Uh, they were often the houses of study as well in, in each neighborhood. Now, the biggest reason was the literacy of Jewish males. There was no need for stained glass or statues. Uh, they learned from studying Torah, Talmud, uh, commentaries they could read. And uh, where in the churches, that's how most of the people learned through stained glass representation of what they call the Old Testament, what we call the Hebrew Bible, and a um, very different way of presenting biblical stories. Let's look at Shav Cathedral and uh, the idea of how Christians viewed Old Testament stories versus how Jews themselves spoke about it, studied it, discussed it. All right, there's a small rondelle that um, shows Adam and Eve, and um, there were, uh, you could see them, the angel chasing them out of the Garden of Eden. You can see Adam and Eve around the, the tree. Um, there are all these different scenes, um, and uh, they're they're very, tiny, but this is how they told the story. And here you see Moses in another section from Saint-Chapelle, it's a medieval church in Paris, um, Moses pleading with uh, Pharaoh, but he's got horns, which is from that terrible mistranslation of Karen, which means ray of light or horn in Hebrew. And this is the reason why they thought Jews had horns because of that mistranslation. Here's another example uh, from a 19th century British church uh, with Abraham and um, Isaac. And you can see the ram has been substituted and the angel says, do not, uh, do not sacrifice your child. But note how there are halos around these figures and how Northern European they look. These, this is not how um, the Judeans <laughs> would have looked or our ancient patriarchs would have looked. Uh, so it was sort of in their, in their own image um, to portray the, the biblical stories and the patriarchs, but in their own, um, sort of in, in the image of uh, European Christians. So biblical topics were illustrated both by Jewish and non-Jewish artists. I am particularly taken by Art Artemisia Gentileschi, who uh, lived in the Baroque period and whose father was also an artist. Um, and she had been raped by her father's uh, assistant. And the, her father had taken him to court and and insisted on damages, they had moved, and I noticed that this was not so long after um, after the uh, expulsion from Spain, and I, I always suspected that she had been a hidden 
Jew or of, of Jewish parentage. It doesn't say that anywhere, but look how she portrays um, Judith uh, beheading um, Holofernes in the episode of, of Judith, uh, the heroine. I mean, it's very graphic. It's almost like um, she w wanted to portray very strong matriarchs and biblical heroines to sort of right the wrong that was done to her. And the fact that her father um, took the perpetrator to court, all of that to me seemed like, I think there was something there in her background that, that led to the way she portrayed in art, um, biblical characters. Um, now, sometimes you have a Jewish topic, but not by a Jewish artist. Here's a Rembrandt called The Jewish Bride in warm, glowing colors and a, a kind of embrace and a, a sign of an oath how he has his hand on her and she is sort of whim, sort of wistfully thinking here um he made many drawings of uh Isaac and Rebecca he uh it's possible that he's turning this uh, Jewish bride a sign of combining something biblical with something contemporary, considering the ornate um, costumes that they're wearing. And this painting is in Amsterdam in the Rijksmuseum, but it's a, a very famous painting depicting a Jewish bride. When we reach the time of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, this is Europe influencing much, much, much of the Western world. And <clears throat> These ideas of liberty, equality, individual rights, this was so new because people wanted to go back to nature. There was an idea of progress, logical thinking, tolerance of different groups, a constitutional government rather than kings and queens, for the first time a separation of church and state, and these international reform movements. We had the French Revolution, American independence, and in Europe, especially in Germany, Great Britain, and France, the idea of emancipation. <clears throat> and here's a poster that says, reasons for naturalizing the Jews in Great Britain and Ireland on the same foot with other nations. And that was a, a, a radical new idea. <clears throat> and, and so we have a depiction of, uh, again, this crossing of the hands, Jacob blessing Ephraim and Menashe, 18th century, um, and a sense of depicting very human um, moments in biblical history. Uh, and we move toward more and more per permission for Jews to become artists. Indeed, we have Moritz Daniel Oppenheim, who was considered the first Jewish painter. Now, the reason I have this painting on the left is because in uh, in the schools, you had to um, copy the works of the old masters. So Moritz Daniel Oppenheim lived in Frankfurt, and he received academic training in Munich and in Paris. And uh, his work spans religious, literary, historical themes. And he as we're going to see, uh, became world famous with his scenes from traditional Jewish family life. He remained Jewish, and many other of the Jewish artists, he didn't convert to Christianity or, or hide in some way deal with his Judaism as a, as a side thing, but not, not his main um, thrust. Um, he commented on the emancipation process of German Jews and their struggle for equal rights, and uh, he had to copy the works of the old masters. So as a student, he showed his Jewish perspective. In copying Raphael's Madonna della Tenda, which means Madonna of the Veil, he omitted some details that seemed too Christian to him. So um, in another one, he doesn't depict young John the Baptist cross staff or here, the halos that appear above the figure's heads in the original painting. So you can see that he understood the lighting, the, foresh the uh, foreshortening of perspective, 
the gaze, the look of the skin, but no halos. Whereas in the original, there was a deification of uh, the Madonna and the child. Here they are just depicted as a mother and a child with, um, I miss James looking on. So he made um, scenes from traditional Jewish family life. And in a way, it was like a statement on German Jews' cultural affiliation. You can see bourgeois values, uh, piety, sense of family, education, and above all, respectability. So he shows this um, alignment with the majority Christian bourgeois principles. And um, you can see here a depiction of Sukkot with a very fancy Sukkot. It's actually got wooden doors and everybody is beautifully dressed. Uh, how do we have some of these? Of course, the originals were colored, but he also made postcards. And many immigrants brought these postcards with them. You can even see a stamp here. And so we have many depictions of scenes of Jewish life. Here are some more. Here's Friday evening blessing the children. And again, look at the fancy dress. Look at the beautiful table set and the decorations on the walls. This is a Sternlicht, which is uh, like a light that is in the form of a star. And it was lit and it stayed lit for most of Shabbat until it went out. Um, here is an example of how he was close with the Rothschild family. And he shows the Rothschild family at prayer, very devout. They were covered with tali taught, they're praying, and uh, just uh, gorgeous uh, hangings in the room, um, as if to say, look, we are elegant, educated people, and you should treat us well. Here's an example of the wedding, and you can see here a very simple talit over them as a chuppah, not even uh, they're combined. And then here you have the, the chuppah, which is just on four poles. So um, the light shows the back of the rabbi here and girls dressed in beautiful costumes, showing again the beauty and the um, community values. Uh, he was very clever with his um, compositions because this architectural balcony here brings your eye back again to the center. People are looking, they are enjoying the, the moment of sanctity, and uh, the eye just keeps coming back and back to where this light brings you. In a time when the majority of Jewish people in Europe were struggling to gain equal opportunity, Oppenheim really chose to showcase Jewish life and culture in his art. Um, here is a bar mitzvah discourse, which interestingly is in the home after synagogue, where the young boy dressed sort of as a young man in a tailored suit is holding forth on his bar mitzvah portion, and the adults are listening uh, carefully and giving him respect. What I find interesting in this is that the light is bringing you to what I imagine is the mother, and the light of, of pride and joy is all on her as uh, her son is giving the discourse. Um, cheder, which means room, actually was the um, like early elementary school. They started at five and they would, uh, by, by 10, they, they really knew all of Torah and started Talmud. So this was the uh, teacher and you see the young boy starting to learn from a book and all of the kids sitting on benches waiting for their turn. Ushering the Sabbath, um, again, you have the Sternlich, the star light, the, the mother blessing with this really gorgeous light on the uh, Kiddush cup, on the table, on her beautiful silk skirt. And I think that the father is saying, you better hurry up because uh, he's looking at his watch. He's got a beautiful pocket watch and saying, uh, you know, it's time. You have to, you have to say the blessing before 18 minutes. Now, in truth, while the women were saying the blessing, most of the men were at synagogue, they would come home, everything would be ready. But I just, I just love this little comment on, you know, it's time. 
Um, the eve of Yom Kippur shows the rabbi just about to do a full prostration. And uh, it, it just is like a snapshot of uh, Kol Nidre. Purim has the kids in costume with the masks and the, the adults looking on with great joy at the Purim spiel that the kids are putting on. Shavuot celebrates the giving of the Torah. Again, this is all scenes from a traditional Jewish family life. We have many, many, many more of these. So some Jews like Oppenheim wanted to portray Jewish life. What happened as the Enlightenment took over and modern age came about late 19th to early 20th century with Jewish artists who then could leave their homes, let's say in Eastern Europe, and go study in Paris, go free the bonds of Jewish life. Well, there are so many like Camille Pizarro, Modigliani, Soutine, and of course we know Marc Chagall. So let's look at some of these uh, Jewish artists who experienced more freedom than their predecessors had had. Um, Jacob Abraham, Camille Pizarro, he liked to use his French name more, but it was Yaakov Avraham. He was born in 1830 on the island of St. Thomas. He's considered actually the father of Impressionism. He moved to Paris and um, he at first was accepted by the official academy, but he broke away and he began painting scenes in nature in a more expressive way. Um, he met Monet and Cezanne and he encouraged younger artists to follow their own style. They created the Salon des Refusés, and he married Julie Vallée, who was a vineyard grower's daughter. They had seven children. Of them, six became painters. And this Pizarro family came from a long line of Spanish and Portuguese conversos. So he really wanted freedom. So he painted regular people, washerwomen, laborers. And um, when... Alfred Dreyfus, who was a Jewish army captain, was tried for treason in anti-Semitic proceedings. He became more political and um, he fought against the anti-Semitic um, time of the Dreyfus affair. But, you know, his mother had to remind him about the High Holy Days. He really struggled with his Jewish identity. So he was married to a non-Jewish woman but he painted her a lot. Here's Julie peeling vegetables and with their child below. Um, his beautiful impressionistic style gave more um, attention to the flowers, to the vines, to the textures than actually to the subject in the paintings. Uh, he painted Montmartre on a winter morning. He painted... Uh, the peasants out in the field, and uh, he experimented with different styles, with colorful paint, very little, if any, black outlines, and so he was considered the father of Impressionism. Uh, now, I bet you didn't know Modigliani was Jewish. Yes, he comes from a Sephardic Jewish family in Livorno, moved to Paris uh, at the time when so many artists were moving to Paris, and uh, he was accepting of his Jewish roots, um, but he, um, he painted all kinds of characters and he was known for his elongated uh, faces. Um, he didn't want to perpetuate anti-Semitic stereotypes. Um, and, uh, he, you know, they all struggled. There was like freedom, and yet they were all considered part of this Jewish group, uh, and they supported each other in Paris. This is um, one of his portraits called The Jewess, and he shows her as very elegant, as if she fits into the style of the time and does make her have a very prominent nose. But uh, again, trying to get away from a stereotype and say, Jews should be considered people and my art should be considered just as an artist. Uh, Chaim Soutine was born and raised in a, a small Jewish settlement near Minsk, 
now it's Belarus. He was the 10th of 11 children. And his father was a tailor and he had very modest means. Um, you know, he was like a Russian born Jew during that era and they had to endure persecution and discrimination. Um, but he wanted to go to the West and he, he sort of fought against his Orthodox family. Um, so he, he once went to the rabbi with a portrait and he, he, he got beaten in punishment. So he, um, he, he wanted to escape that and just express himself. So his work is much more expressionistic. And you can see in his landscapes, they're not um, natural looking. It's more, how do you feel with woods around you? How do you feel um, in a portrait? He uses greens and yellows in a, in a very expressionistic way, very different from the impressionists who had more of the petit point, these little dots of color. Uh, this is his pastry chef, le, le pâtissier. And uh, again, how does it feel to have the warmth of things cooking and baking? You feel that in the yellows and the reds of this painting and slightly um, distorted features. So we're going now from 1918 to 1934. You can see the development of his art and how he just wants to show um, plain people, a baker, a servant girl, um, a random landscape, not, not anything that lofty. We move to Jacques Lifschitz. Um, you know, with the German occupation of France during World War II and the deportation of Jews to the Nazi death camps, Lifschitz had to flee France. And he had the assistance of an American journalist and escaped the Nazi regime, came to the United States and settled um, in uh, upstate New York. So his L'Homme à la Mandoline um, was exhibited in the Third Sculpture International Exhibition held at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, that was 1949. And he has been identified among those sculptors in a photograph Life magazine published that was taken from that exhibition. Um, he had a big retrospective um, in 1954 uh, and he did small bronzes. So he moved from wood to bronze and uh, he became more involved as he became older in his Jewish faith. And he even referred to himself as a religious Jew in 1970. He began abstaining from work on Shabbat, put on tefillin, and he became very close with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson. So this one is called The Prayer. We're going to look at that more in detail. It's from 1943. Uh, the Sacrifice. So these are... Uh, moving from wood to bronze and uh, in his very particular style, <clears throat> very um, large forms and yet readable. You can understand what they're saying. This version of uh, Lifshitz's Tree of Life um, was supposed to represent the history of the Jewish nation. He made a hundred prints and he presented it to the Rebbe. He would visit the Rebbe uh, at times and he was very close with him and it kind of brought him back to his Jewish roots. So this is a detail of the prayer from 1943. Uh, it's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art and um, he made it in a, in a foundry in, in Long Island City, New York. It represented a tremendous feat of bronze casting. It's very large and there's an intricate arrangement of both concave and convex forms, delicate surfaces. It made the casting very difficult. He used the image of an aged broken man performing a ritual sacrifice. Um, and in a way, this was to express his horror at the discovery of Nazi concentration camps. He recalled that as he was making this work, he was crying, which was his heartfelt prayer for the innocent victims of Hitler's atrocities. Um, in this composition, we can slowly make out a figure of an old man entangled in like flame-like foliage. He's got a heavy ornate talit, uh, and he swings a large terrified rooster over his head, you know, like kapara, 
before Rosh Hashanah. And he holds in his other hand a book. Maybe it's a Sidur, but it has burst into flames. You can see it right here in his hand. And there's the, the rooster that's being thrust over his head. There's his face and his beard and his talit. As we look closer, the forms become even more terrifying. The man's midsection has been ripped open by what appears to be three ram's heads exposing the form of a fetal lamb. Curled up, uh, it's like the very act of shattering um, this, this kapara, this, this ritual. He himself has been disemboweled considered soul-shattering blasts of the ram's horn. And, um, you know, on, on, on the Yom Kippur, we have this uh, sending out the, the, the goats to Azazel uh, to atone for the sins of the Jewish people. Lifshitz understood the power of this work, and he explained that the entire subject is the Jewish people and he thought of them as the innocent victims in the horrible war. Here's a quote. I was praying, I was crying when I made this work. A very difficult piece. Now, Chaim Gross was from the Ukraine. He immigrated to the U.S. in 1921. And he studied at various art institutes, including the Art Institutes League in New York. Uh, Raphael Sawyer was part of that Jewish group of artists. Actually, my mother, who was a fine artist, studied with Raphael Sawyer and was part of that Art Students League. Um, but he taught from 1926 for over 50 years, art, lithograph, sculpture, varied media. And during the 30s, he was part of the government's public artworks project. And he made sculptures for schools and federal buildings and the, the 1939 World's Fair. He traveled all over the world, Central America, West Africa, India, Indonesia, to find native hardwoods for his sculptures. And he, um, he began um, as direct carving in wood, then moved to working in bronze. And uh, you can see that he also made a whole series of um, holiday lithographs. We have um, Shabbat, Hanukkah, Zizmanish uh, Tanah Pesach, from generation to generation, these beautiful watercolors. This one of Purim we have hanging in the Jewish community of Sedona in the Verde Valley. It was donated by Shirley and Demetrius Fornos, and it used to be hanging upstairs. Now it's down in the library. So let's look at some of Chaim Gross's sculptures, for which he's very famous. He began in wood. And um, the direct carving in wood was sort of limited by the, by the properties of wood. But once he worked in bronze, he was more free to have uh, different balances. And you can see he enjoyed um, showing acrobats and circus and uh, a, a certain lightness. Um, so they became much more dynamic and his, the poses seemed to tumble through space. Quite amazing. Um, you can look up Chaim Gross. I actually visited his studio when he was in Cape Cod and um, I was privy to, to visit many artist studios because of my mother's connection with, uh, with artists in New York and, and in Provincetown in Cape Cod. I must speak about Holocaust art because it influenced our whole people forever. And uh, this butterfly, a symbol of freedom, but on barbed wire, a symbol of being imprisoned. Um, this, this just spoke to me and I wanted to begin our talk of Holocaust art with this picture. Now, um, the frequent use of gates and uh, dark colors were um, often used in Holocaust art. More than 140,000 people were deported to the Theresien ghetto 
It was established in 1941 until the last days of the war, and about 120,000 of them died. There were miserable conditions, and the rest were murdered after being taken to extermination camps. Um, now, there are no people in this pen and ink drawing by um, Bedrich Frita on the left, and he calls it rear entrance because the front was all a show for people, uh, including the Red Cross. It's kind of a metaphor for death, and it shows high walls and a half open gate and um, the only path is into darkness. He hid his work in the courtyard while other members of his ghetto's artist group bricked their pictures into walls before they were arrested in 1944. And um, there's a lot of pictorial evidence of the reality in the camp. Um, yeah, he, he actually was murdered before the end of the war but you see, the Nazis presented Theresien as a so-called show ghetto designed to convince the outside world that life was, it's just a Jewish settlement. It was perfectly normal. They invited the Red Cross and um, they were writing positive reports because it was such a show place. So the bleak and expressive images reveal the reality of the camp. Now, Leo Breuer had um, uh, a Catholic mother and a Jewish father, and he did survive the war, and he was able to bring out some of his pictures. This one is the path be between the barracks. Um, symbols of persecution and degradation were imposed upon Jews by the Nazis, and you can see uh, here in the self-portrait by Felix Nussbaum, he is looking at us, he's looking at the viewer, and he seems to be cornered next to a crumbling and dirty white wall, which was one of his symbols of um, menace and danger. You see that wall kind of like oppressive. Uh, he's lifting his coat collar up. Do you see what he's revealing? The yellow badge of shame. The uh, He was concealing it. And his left hand shows his Jewish identity card. And he look, looks very nervous and... Um, he asks of us, what does it mean to look at him in that state? Uh, beyond this wall, a cloud, a, a, crowd, a cloud is floating in the lowering sky while windows of a nearby house witness the scene. So I don't know if that means shelter or maybe the bystanders, those who witness um, his danger from the safety of their own homes. And you see, often he uses a cut off tree. It, it's, um, there's no limbs on it. It's a symbol in Jewish uh, funerary, funerary art of a life cut short. And in his art, a symbol of melancholy, hopelessness and death. And in this dark and despairing scene, uh, a blossoming branch grows from a lower limb of the dead tree right here. Uh, and that's a small patch of blue sky, you know, a small symbol of optimism. And you really have to look at the symbolism in his art. It's the human quality of hope, even in the shadow of death. Nobody wants to believe they're actually going to die. Um, he holds on to a glimmer of hope that he and his loved ones would survive. The hiding place with his wife, Felka, and, and Jackie, another persecuted person, um, talk about the only hope is the map on the wall. Maybe there's a place we can go. And you see how, uh, again, you have a cut off tree, a window, and a very unusual shadow that makes no sense, um, given the light that's coming in from this window. You see a Jewish star, you see a tallit, you see a, a newspaper. Um, and unfortunately, Felix Nussbaum was one of the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. But there were all these ways of trying to get by, even with the oppression and the closing in of the walls and the futility of finding a safe place, the uh, times of hiding only to be discovered and then murdered. Alex La Kahana, um, was a Hungarian Holocaust survivor. The Hungarian Jews weren't taken till 44, so some of them were able to survive. She was a teenage inmate in the Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, camps, and um, she 
did writings and abstract paintings about the Holocaust. She transformed the horror of their deaths into, deaths into a testament on their lives. She was liberated on April 15th, 1944, and then lived in Sweden and then immigrated to the United States. She settled in Texas where she started to study art. So first she wanted to paint um, this wonderful new country, bright colors. But when in 78, she returned to Hungary and she saw no memorial, nothing remained. She started making these collages like I'm showing you here as a memorial to the dead, um, as a triumph of human spirituality over inhuman evil. She was interviewed in uh, the book From Ashes to the Rainbow and she said, I started to paint only about the Holocaust as a tribute and memorial to those who did not return. I'm still not finished. So you can see a large dark work with shadowy prison bars and closed doors and collaged right into the center in a pool of light is a photograph of Kahana's sister. Um, during the filming of The Last Days by Spielberg, a documentary about the Holocaust, she really appears there and she was able to locate Edith's grave. Kahana's father was one of the Jews rescued by Swedish businessman Raoul Wallenberg, who saved, you know, over 100,000 people by giving them Swedish passports. On the right, you have rectangles that become windows uh, to freedom, arches become ovens, black lines become railroad ties, and numbers become endless days in a senseless, calendar. There's a spray of red paint which becomes the spilled blood of victims and through it all however shines Kahana's belief that the spirit of people can survive any horror and eventually triumph over evil. Um, I remember her exhibit at the Skirball Museum where she explained some of her art that at first was very dense and difficult for me but once she explained it about the collaging of actual documents right into it um, I could see I could see how she meant to make a tribute. Now another kind of Holocaust art was Ellie Leskley. He created a kind of pictorial ghetto diary, and he was fearful that the SS would search for this evidence of incriminating the Germans. So he destroyed and cut up many of his paintings, and especially the captions. But his wife Elsa managed to salvage the fragments and hid them. So after liberation, they recovered the hidden artworks. That's why you see doubles here. Um, he wrote about Theresienstadt or Theresien, and um, there was desperation lurking in every moment of life in this show ghetto. So life is seen through the prism of everyday errands and chores depicted in grotesque caricatures. He challenges the Nazi anti-Jewish concepts <laughs> and tries to uh, use his style because he was a commercial advertisement artist. And um, he changed his name to Ellie Leskley when he was in Israel. And I curated an exhibit in 1987 where we mounted both the originals, the smaller ones on the left, and the newly painted ones on the right where he added the captions and uh, he had more paints, he had more, more art supplies. And I mounted this um, on a kind of fencing to portray like barbed wire. And it was the introduction pathway in the entrance hall of Temple Israel of Hollywood when our children performed Brundibar, which was an operetta performed by children in Theresienstadt. So it was very, very moving for me to do. So here, here's one. Um, where it says the, the ghetto woman, he was able to, in the, in the reconstructed uh, watercolors, he was able to put back his captions like, today we are showing. And, and you can see that it's like almost like a puppet um, dancing, but it was all for show. Oh, terrible. Um, I can't tell you what it meant to have our, our children who were, you know, seventh grade, fifth grade at the time, performing an operetta that had been performed by children in Theresienstadt, very contemporary 
uh, Czech music, not easy, but it does show in, in, there was a, a veiled triumph over the bad guy in the operetta. And as you walked in, the whole lobby was taken up with this exhibit of Ellie Leslie's paintings that uh, we had borrowed from the um, the kind of uh, actually a small um, Holocaust Museum at the Federation at the time. So we have to move now to Marc Chagall. Uh, he found much inspiration for his work in his hometown, his home little shtetl, and he lived much of his life in France. Um, his real name was Moisha Chagall, S-H-A-G-A-L, and uh, he was an early modernist associated with major artistic styles. He had various periods like surrealism, cubism, expressionism, phobism. He was part of the School of Paris. He used symbolism. So he, he lived long. And so he had a wide range of artistic formats, including painting, drawings, book illustrations, stained glass, which we'll see. Stage sets, ceramics, tapestries, fine art prints. I mean, he really tried everything. So um, he was considered sort of Russian French. Okay, so he was born in, in uh, Russia, moved to France, and he could sketch, paint. Um, and before World War I, he visited Paris, St. Petersburg, Berlin, and he built his own blend of traditional and contemporary art in connection with Jewish folk culture and the Eastern European uh, memories of his childhood. Here you have the violinist in 1912, which morphed into a more fanciful green violinist in 1924. And we know it as Fiddler on the Roof. You can see the roofs beneath him and the Fiddler uh, high up in the air with people floating. We recognize this as a Chagall right away. Um, he loved Bella and uh, brought her flowers. Here you have kind of a loving look of a kiss, the birthday from 1915. From 1914, the praying Jew, the rabbi of Vitesk, and he played with the lines of the tefillin that are kind of um, replicated in the rest of the uh, talit um, design. Um, there's a the curve of the talit is shown in the curving of the background. I mean, a lot of um, the tzitzit are sort of exaggerated, and you see that he's playing with forms here. Um, once he got used to this uh, model, he became a little more figurative and more nostalgic. Look, in 1959, he 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 portrayed a Jew with Torah and um, very different style with the village in the background. Uh, so that, that shtetl life as a Hasidic uh, Jew was a strong influence on his work throughout his life. He had a kind of mysticism and um, a sympathy for his religious roots wherever he traveled. Uh, but he, he sort of symbolized a dichotomy between traditional Jewish art and modernist art. Um, now, he was in danger, as were many Jewish artists during the Second World War, and when Nazi officials purged Jewish muse uh, German museums of works uh, the party considered to be degenerate, um, they took over a thousand paintings and 4,000 watercolors, including the works of Marc Chagall, Kandinsky, Paul Klee, Piet Mondrian, Frank Marc, and they were all burned in the courtyard of a fire station in Berlin. See, he was a pretty high profile Jew. He was put on a list of artists who lives, whose lives were at risk and he escaped to America in 41. Chagall and Bella arrived in New York the day after Germany invaded the Soviet Union. And then after, after the war, he returned to France. Um, but he always included these memories of his pre-war home uh, and its folk culture. He also portrayed biblical scenes like Jacob's dream. And in this dream, the latter is like the divine connection between God and Jacob's family. 
The dream was God's way of encouraging Jacob to continue with his mission, fulfill his people's destiny. And this style is kind of surrealistic. Surrealism is a movement in visual art and literature, which flourished in Europe between the wars, between World War I and II. And um, surrealists emphasized positive expression, but they could exaggerate and bring in a kind of mystical style. Um, it was kind of against the rationalism guided European culture and politics that led to the wars. Uh, it reunited the conscious and unconscious realms of experience. So what better thing than a dream to introduce the world of fantasy to our rational world? And what I love here is that here's the ladder, but hey, the angels don't need don't need the ladder. They're floating around it. And uh, there's kind of a difference between the blue and purple, maybe um, maybe day and night, maybe uh, rational and and dreamlike, and you can see Jacob is actually dreaming, but his dream self is rising here and experiencing this dream. Uh, Moses and the burning bush. Here we have a Moses who has rays of light. Again, that idea of what led in Christian art to horns. Here we have it as rays of light and never a depiction of God as in Christian iconography um, with uh, an actual figure, but here just the the letters, yud heh vav -Hey, the unpronounceable name of God in the burning bush. And you see he has taken off his shoes and he's showing by his hand that he's extremely moved and, and saying, Hineni, here I am. Here's receiving the tablets of law and you have a kind of hand of God coming through the cloud giving him the tablets and again the rays of light where the light is emanating from the Holy One and is reflected by, by Moses while the children of Israel are clustered at the foot of the mountain. And perhaps that's Aaron with the menorah or perhaps it's giving rise to that light in uh, later years being um, exemplified by the menorah. We're very familiar with the Chagall windows. They are shown in the, the originals are in the Hadassah hospital where I gave birth to our first child, Tali. I had been a tour guide showing these to tourists, but after I gave birth, I went into the chapel and wept and said, oh, now these windows have a message for me. It was a very moving moment. This is based on the blessing that Jacob gave his sons at the end of Genesis and they were turned into many other forms, such as the Benjamin theme um, in a, a, a glass, a very uh, modern um, kind of a design uh, in a mezuzah. We at the Jewish community of Sedona and the Verde Valley are blessed to have uh, the Chagall windows made into needlepoint that was donated by Sue Nauer of Blessed Memory, and again, translated from stained glass into something that can be um, done in needlepoint. You have here Asher with the uh, menorah because of oil and um, the richness. Here you have Benjamin. Um, it, it's just the, 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 the hands of blessing um, just beautiful translation of his work.
come now to the modern age and Jewish art in the diaspora. Let's look at Yaakov Agam, who was the father of kinetic art. He was born Yaakov Gipstein in Rishon Lezion, which was then Mandate Palestine. His father was a rabbi and a Kabbalist. He trained at that Betzalel Academy of Art and Design in Jerusalem, he moved to Switzerland, then to Paris, and he, he was a pioneer in kinetic art. He's known for something called the agamograph, which really depends on the angle of the viewer. But I would like to share with you an experience, and this is visual music. It plays in front of the eye. A team, I don't know what you see. The center point is only black and white. And then black and white opens and gets inside another melody and become rich and rich and rich till it fill up from minimalism to maximalism. This is my heart. Time is something, by definition, that you cannot repeat. Nobody can repeat time. Mm -hmm. So every time you touch it, something new will come. So this was the studio of Paul Gauguin, and uh, so you are in a historical place in somehow. Could you see the sound?
Now let's look at another Israeli artist, Reuven Rubin, who painted beautiful idealistic scenes of, uh, of, of Israel. He was born in Romania, he trained in art in Paris, but um, he's really an Israeli artist. And he said, I paint what I love, my people, my family, my country. To paint means to sing and every artist must make his voice heard. Such a sweet story. When he was 19, he used his last few coins from the sale of his bicycle to make the journey to the Holy Land, which he reached after many adventures. Tel Aviv at the time was just a tiny village among sand dunes, <clears throat> but he felt this was the land of destiny. And he studied at the Bezalel School of Art. He exhibited in the first art exhibition in, in Jerusalem in 1922. He had a one-man show in the Jerusalem exhibits uh, in 1924, another one in 1932. And that launched the Tel Aviv Art Museum. He designed scenery for Habima, which is Israel's national theater. And he was one of the first Israeli artists to achieve international recognition. He tried to create an indigenous style of art he wanted to join Western and Eastern styles. Uh, you can see his custom of signing his first name in Hebrew and his last name in Roman letters. Here we've got Reuben, Reuben. So I made it uh, large here so you could see how he signed partially in Roman letters, it's called, and partially in Hebrew letters. So he showed King David, Klezmer musicians, Jerusalem, the port of old Jaffa, uh, Dove of Peace, the Orange Groves near Jaffa, uh, all in a very lovely, colorful style. Uh, he painted the Yishuv, which was, that's the early settlement of Jews in the early part of the 20th century, and especially landscapes, also paintings of the Israeli worker. <clears throat> Biblical themes uh, sometimes occurred in his work, and it was re really very popular um, all over the world. He was named the first ambassador to Romania from 48 to 50, and he wrote an autobiography. It was called My Life, My Art, and he received the Israel Prize in 1973 for all of his artistic achievements. Um, now, not all of the art was centered around Jerusalem. Uh, there was a huge group of artists, and still till today, in Tzfat, or in English, Safed. This is uh, Shalom Moskovitz, who became known as Shalom of Safed. He was um, uh, a watchmaker and a toy maker, and he began painting at age 55 in a primitive style that's called naive, uh, primitive. And you can see everything's flat and almost childlike. Uh, Safed, or Tzfat, had long attracted artists due to its mystical and romantic qualities. Uh, this mountain town of Kabbalah presented a vision and um, a lot of tradition of Jewish life, like Klezmer or the Sephardic and Ashkenazi communities, the Hasidic community, the synagogue, and also its geography um, is mountainous with a view of Mount Meron. And so many artists traveled and lived in this ancient city and recognized the artistic potential of the city. Here are two renditions of Jacob's Ladder, um, one where you can see the angels going up and then the other angels coming down while Jacob is lying down on the ground with the stones under his head. Um, this one is a, a detail of another view. I couldn't get a, a larger picture, but I wanted to show that the dreaming Joseph looks down at the, uh, the actual body of Joseph who is asleep, uh, I mean Jacob, um, and, and you know how it is, sometimes you can leave your body in a dream. Uh, so I, I really thought this was a very interesting one where you see double and the, the stones underneath. Uh, so Jacob's Ladder, again, with the angels going up and down in a very um, colorful style, um, very stylized with the, uh, the tree, flower, 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 leaf, 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 leaf. You know, it's a very um, pictorial um, sort of literal style of, of painting. Very, very popular. Here are some more. Um, this is The Binding of Isaac, almost in a cartoon. Um, here are two different renditions, but I want you to notice that the eye enters from the right, just like Hebrew is written from right to left. 
Many Israeli artists automatically begin to show movement from right to left because that's how you write Hebrew. And here it begins the story at the bottom and works its way up to the top of the end of the story where the angel stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, who is shown here as a bearded young man of like 37, not as a young boy. And um, the attendants that you see here following him are in the costume styles of people who lived in his surroundings. There's even a bit of humor. One man is smoking a nargila on the way, a water pipe, and you can see the ram caught in the thicket at the top left row in both renditions. But again, the eye definitely shows movement from right to left, which is not like a Western art artist or cartoonist would start from probably from the top and from the left. So I just wanted you to notice that. Um, Amos Amit's work uh, was very influenced by his childhood in Northern Israel. He loved batik, it fascinated him because it's been practiced for centuries and it involves the use of wax and dye on cloth. Um, the Amit family were our neighbors and our children went to nursery school together. So I often saw his batiks and had several hanging in our home. Uh, this one is the Tiberius Fish Market. This one is Jonah and the whale. You can see Jonah within the whale here and the, the people who have just, the sailors have just thrown him overboard to stop the incredible storm. And uh, Nineveh is, is pictured as the far off city that he is supposed to go and prophesy. So a lot going on in this particular batik. Uh, he also uses the theme of the fiddler on the roof, um, very stylized. And again, the texture that you get beautiful from the creases of the material um, after the wax has been melted. Here's a wedding canopy also by Amos. And um, I called him up to tell him I would be using his work. He said, Babakasha, go right ahead. He was very pleased. David Friedman is one of the Sfat artists, uh, very contemporary. I have one of his works on my wall uh, and he, uh, has a very meditative technique of Kabbalah using 72 three-letter names of God in this particular picture. So you have uh, Psalms here, the entire chapter one, Ashrei Ha'ish, uh, happy is the man who goes after uh, good advice and stays away from evil people. And it's done almost in a 60s poster style. Um, the seed of creation here, you have uh, Malach Melech Imloch, past, present, future, God reigned, is reigning, will reign, and uh, all in like a, a kind of a seed with a very stylized tree of life of the Sephirot in the middle. Um, I, I wanted to research the 72 holy names more, so I found out that, um, how did he portray it? Well, the triplets of this name are derived from three verses in Exodus chapter 14, um, verses 19, 20, and 21, they tell the story of the splitting of the Red Sea when the Israelites left Egypt, which it starts with Vaisa Malach Elohim, and the angel of Elohim who went before the camp moved, went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved before them and went behind them. And it tells that whole story about Moshe stretching out his hand over the sea and God causing the sea to go back with a strong east wind and made the sea into dry land and the waters were parted. So those verses were kind of taken apart in this way. So if you look at this picture and you read just the blue letters starting from the upper right hand corner, Vayisamalach Elohim, it tells the story of the first verse. Then if you read just the red letters backwards, starting from the lower left corner, Vayavo, you can see it right here. Um, and you see Vayavo, that the angel comes between the two camps. And to find the third verse, you read the green letters, starting again at the right upper corner. Vayet Moshe et Yado. Moses spread out his hand. So isn't that clever? So you just look at different direction and it's all hidden, just like God's presence is hidden. So these are the 72 holy names made up of three letters taken from those verses. 
uh, sometimes he he shows it as a kind of cosmic knot, just uh, uh, within itself, and moving from circles to squares to triangles to a kind of hidden uh, Star of David. You can see it a little bit closer here. And this is the one I have on my wall, Ain Sof, without end. And this is showing the Kabbalistic tree of life as if you're looking from the top, so it's concentric circles rather than from the side where you usually see right, left, going from top to bottom. Keter, Keter, Keter. So here's Keter going down to Malkut for those who understand. The meaning is without end. It refers to the Holy One that is limitless beyond our understanding. And uh, this twisted knot intrigued me with the Star of David as a backdrop. It's like a geometric combination of heaven and earth. So many ways to portray which is beyond logic. Now, there are women artists, and I worked with Yael Kanarek. Um, she took this commentary uh, from Genesis 41 about um, Joseph and Pharaoh, but she turned it in her work from everything masculine to feminine, everything feminine to masculine, in this organization called Beit Torah Ta, the house of her Torah, as opposed to Beit Torah To, his Torah. And it's really wild to see Joseph as a woman, Pharaoh as a woman, and everything has changed. Uh, and in her art here, um, she's got some translations, especially, can we find a woman like this? The spirit of Elohim is in her, as opposed to, as we read the traditional, in him. Um, so Torah Ta, her Torah, this old group, opens possibilities of inclusion who seek the feminine divine, and um, looking at sacred texts from a different lens. So Torah Ta is regendering the Hebrew Bible, and you can look it up um, and see more work of Yael Kanarek. She's the creator, director, and translator of Beit Torah Ta. She founded it in 2016. She's an artist in multimedia. She focuses on the relationship between language and form in sculpture, jewelry, and internet art. And this, this is one that I um, that I ordered, and it says Tosef interprets Para's dream, making it feminine rather than masculine. Another Jewish artist, uh, Judy Chicago, she's a poet and an installation artist. This is the dinner party, and she wanted to undo and sort of redress women's traditional underrepresentation in the visual arts. So she focused on female subject matter. This is very famous, the dinner party, and it celebrates the achievement of women throughout history. It really scandalized audiences because um, she used vaginal imagery, the uh, triangles everywhere. And um, she also wanted to use needlework, embroidery, and, and what we would call um, lower arts that were overlooked. And so she, uh, she um, made this huge uh, triangular table, which measures 48 feet on each side, and she placed 39 place settings, which were dedicated to prominent women throughout history, and then an additional 999 names inscribed on the table's glazed porcelain brick base. And uh, each individual place setting um, went from ancient history, like the primordial goddess Ishtar to Theodora, Artemisia Gentileschi that we saw, the artist um, in the Renaissance, Sacagawea, uh, Native American, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, Emily Dickinson, poets, um, Georgia O'Keeffe. So she goes from ancient history to contemporary times. And uh, there's an embroidered table runner that includes the name of the woman, with utensils, a goblet, and a plate for each table setting. Huge undertaking, which she couldn't do alone. So um, she was an educator and an organizer, and she co-founded the feminist art program at Cal State Fresno and Woman House, which was an installation and performance space. And she um, embraced artistic media uh, that often had been called just craft. So here you see researchers finding connections between famous women and the appropriate style to represent them. So they use needlework, ceramics, glass art, 
uh, alongside traditional high art media like painting. And this, uh, this work, Dinner Party, kind of broke the barrier and helped validate the importance of craft-based art forms and to break down the boundaries separating them from their, quote, high art counterparts. Do you know that this dinner party has been seen by millions of viewers by this time? Uh, another uh, two Jewish women artists, this is Audrey Flack. <laughs> she created um, a kind of still life called matzah meal. And she just took products that you would buy at a Jewish supermarket for Passover and made it uh, kind of like Andy Warhol, sort of making it um, more important than just applesauce and matzo meal would be. Here is a kind of outrageous painting of the Seder meal. This is Nicole Eisenman's Seder from 2010. And it was in a um, an exhibition in the Jewish Museum called Masterpieces and Curiosities. She's from New York, and she plays with humor, caricature, and she critiques pop, pop culture. Um, this is almost like <laughs> just making fun of um, of who sits at the Seder. Don't, doesn't anybody have a sort of odd uncle that sort of looks strange? What she did here was she makes us, the viewer, the leader of the Seder. We're breaking the matzah. These are our hands. And our eyes are looking at the table and noticing the different um, more traditional and sort of outrageous uh, representatives of the family. She also created a Seder plate, which uh, was re reproduced in the Jewish Museum shop uh, with sort of uh, <laughs> kind of a fun Seder plate because you've got the bone, the horseradish, the cementy stuff, that's the haroset, the egg, and then she's got bitter herbs and not so bitter herbs. <laughs> so she's just playing with it. Um, humor is really an essential part of Jewish life, even, even Passover. Now, Jewish art in the diaspora here in America, we have Siona Benjamin um, that I partnered with at the Amen Institute for a year of partnering rabbi, rabbi and artist. So she was born in India and that... Um, the uh, B'nai Israel is the community of Jews in India, and she is really cross-cultural, transcultural, and her perspective bridges the traditional and the modern and across cultures. Um, she has family in Israel, America, but her parents still live in India, and she remembers the ornate synagogues of her Bombay, now Mumbai, childhood. And... Um, she grew up with Hindu and Muslim society. She was educated in a Catholic and Zoroastrian schools. She was raised Jewish, uh, but now she's in America. So she always reflects on these different cultures. Um, she combines the imagery of her past with how she lives in America today. It's a kind of mosaic. And she often makes blue-skinned characters. Um, she has a self-portrait of herself with um, blue and she has um, a, a book she wrote and uh, online called Blue Like Me, which is available for streaming, I think on Amazon Prime. I was paired for her commentaries for the Amen Institute. We did Balotecha where Miriam is struck with Sara'at. So we studied together <clears throat> and then she went and created this art with Miriam and Sephora. So they're both blue, but since Sephora was supposed to be black, she painted her as a darker blue and made her with her gaze downward where Miriam's gaze is more direct. Uh, she also works in materials. She makes hoopas and synagogue art. She's quite um, sought after for uh, commissions. Here is Miriam and Sephora. I hope you can hear it as well as see the video that we presented as our final project.
Anna Elna Rifana La Anna Elna Rifana La Anna Elna Rifana La Anna Elna Rifana בירושלים נערכה הפגנה רבתי של בני ישראל, עליהם הצטרפו אזרחים רבים אשר יצאו בקריאה לביטול הנחיות הרבנות הראשית בדבר רישום נישואים של בני עדה זו. ההפגנה נערכה בעיצומה של שביתת הרעב אשר ערכו נציגי בני ישראל, שביתה שעוררה הדים רבים בארץ ומחוצה לה. בעקבות שביתת הרעב וההפגנה התכנסה הכנסת למושב מיוחד תוך הפגרה שלה כדי לדון בבעיה. על דעת הכנסת נתקבלה הודעתו של ראש הממשלה, מר לוי אשכול, כי בני ישראל נחשבים כיהודים לכל דבר. מר אשכול פנה אל הרבנות הראשית בקריאה לעזור בעצירת תחושת האפליה. בעקבות הודעה זו הפסיקו 32 משפחות בני ישראל את שביתתם שנמשכה 29 יום. Anna Elna Rifana La Anna Elna Rifana La Anna Elna Rifana La Anna Elna Rifana La Heal our bodies, open our hearts, awaken our minds, Shekhina Heal our bodies, open our hearts, awaken our minds, Shekhinah. Anna Elna Rifana La, Anna Elna Rifana La Nu. We move now to other ways that Jewish artists express their art. <laughs> Lionel Reese was a Polish-American Jewish painter born in Poland, grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and he studied commercial art. His family had moved to the United States in 1898 when he was four years old. And as immigrants, um, they were part of a large Eastern European Jewish community fleeing their native countries at the start of the 20th century. There they were in the Lower East Side, and Reese worked as a commercial artist for newspapers, publishers, and a motion picture company. And eventually he became art director for Paramount Studios and is credited to be the creator of Leo the Lion, the logo of Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios. Here is an early iteration of that logo. But he also um, was known for his portraits of Jewish people and landmarks in Jewish history. And he, uh, made a trip to Europe, Africa, and the Middle East in the early 1920s. He was fascinated with Jewish life in the old world, so he depicted what he saw of the pre-World War II Jewish life. He published a book in 1938 at the dawn of the Holocaust, and he called it, My Models Were Jews. He wanted to demonstrate that there's no such thing as a Jew Jewish ethnicity, but rather it's a cultural group or religion and there's significant diversity within the Jewish communities, as we saw with, with uh, Siona Benjamin, you know, with the, from the Indian community. I mean, Jews lived all over the world and different communities in different geographical regions. So he was presenting an argument against what he considered to be a common misconception that existed about Jews. Uh, in 1954, he made a new book called New Lights and Old Shadows. That dealt with the new lights of a reborn Israel and the old shadows of an almost eradicated European Jewish culture. His last book, A World of Twilight, which was only published in 1972, had text by Isaac Bashevis Singer, and he portrayed uh, a portrait of the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe. So here is Lionel Reese, North African Jew sifting flower, and Galician rabbi, an etching. Beautifully trained and had uh, a really good eye. Now, art also creates the theme, the mood for conferences. This was just recently um, an art piece uh, 
that was the logo for the Ohala Renewal Gathering that I'm part of for rabbis, cantors, spiritual directors, and students. And it was called Shalshelet HaKabbalah, a lineage of innovation. And you can see Matovu Ohalecha Yisrael. Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov, Mishkenotecha Yisrael. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your house of worship, your dwelling place, O Israel, with an inviting open tent um, in a lovely inviting landscape. So people gathered. I was only able to attend this time on Zoom, but um, this is a yearly gathering. And each time there's a different artistic rendering of what the theme is for that year. I wanted to show you some current art and installations since October 7th, the massacre by Hamas into Israel. Um, this is 203 empty chairs for Shabbat, an Israeli installation for hostages that was replicated in several places. And each one, uh, had the name and picture of a kidnapped hostage. And at the time of this recording, there are still 136 hostages who have not returned to freedom in Israel. We pray for them all the time. Here we have um, Joy Gordon's daughter, Robin Awend, uh, one of her many posters uh, that she created as a... Um, a fundraiser for Israel. All the all the proceeds go, and you can find her online. This one says, "I am here," and you can see the Hebrew Hineni. I stand with Israel now and forever. I'm Yisrael Chai, and there are other wonderful posters that she created, and we we thank a joy for bringing that to us. Now, here are two contemporary um, posts. October 7th artists uh, renderings by Zoya Cherkasky. One is uh, an Israeli family hiding in terrified silence beneath a lamp, which was inspired by Pablo Picasso's Guernica uh, because the Spanish artist uh, portrayed the Nazi bombing of the Basque town during the Spanish Civil War. And it was the first image that came to mind when she learned of the massacre. And you can see the young people uh, fleeing from the the peace concert where suddenly there were shots ringing out it's uh, of our time so shocking uh, marion boo created the dance also based on a, a very known work by matisse uh, she posted it on instagram just two weeks after october 7th and she transformed Oya matisse's fame the dance into something shocking because the women of this, it's called the last dance, are not in a free-spirited joy dancing as they twirl hand in hand. They are blood-soaked and dancing in a pool of blood. And it's meant to shock us and to see what should not have happened and that we have to somehow um, make right and rescue and, and help. Now we are also surrounded by beautiful art in our own synagogue. Our ark that holds three Torah scrolls made in wood to look like one of the mountains with Shema Yisrael in bronze by Jessica Sierra and um, donated by uh, Skip and Elaine Fox helped with the connection to the foundry and um, very recently, Jessica reconfigured it with light. And so I can change the lights according to the theme of the week. So when we receive Torah, it's all red, like the flaming mountain. And uh, when we cross the sea, it's all in blue for crossing the sea. So it's it's a wonderful arc. And this is the Ner Tamid. You see it in close up here with the carved yud Hey vav Hey by Susan Zalkand in alabaster and the eternal light looks like a piece of frozen flame. Everyone comments on it when they come. The Ten Commandments, carved in wood by Mark Kahn uh, with Anochi Adonai in uh, uh, mesquite wood that actually was charred by lightning. So there's something in connection there, like the lightning and thunder of the giving of the Torah. And the Tree of Life in bronze by John Soderbergh with the Kabbalistic Sefirot, the energy centers represented here in uh, bronze by um, 
uh, rimonim by pomegranates. And the pomegranate down here in Malchut at the grounded place is split open and bursting with seeds. And it says, Eitz Chaim He is a tree of life to them that hold fast to it. And underneath the ground, you have the roots with 12 either jewels or fruits representing the 12 tribes. Um, the founders are represented in the leaves here. And then the lighter leaves are fundraiser for Simchas. People donate money for that. Skip Fox of Blessed Memory uh, gave us the menorah that you saw in an earlier lesson. And uh, this other bronze is the latest um, artwork that was put on our Eastern wall. It's a Shiviti. I place God before me always. Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid uh, with lions that are traditional and yet untraditional because we have a female and a male lion that John Soderberg of Blessed Memory wanted to make... Um, a statement about being uh, egalitarian and the Keter Torah, the crown of Torah. One of our beautiful Torah mantles is this Torah cover with the Dove of Peace by Barbara Fisher. Uh, and uh, this is a Holocaust Torah that we are guardians of and, and very proud to use. And we mentioned the Chagall windows in Needlepoint by Sunaro, a blessed memory that hang in our stairwell on the way from the offices to the library. Um, this Chaim Gross is the Purim uh, depiction of holidays that we have donated by Shirley and Demetrios Purnos of blessed memory. And uh, now you can place it in, in context. You can see he writes here Haman, uh, Haman being, with, being hanged on the gallows and the rabbi reading from the Megillah. Um, it's uh, Purim written here in Hebrew and the masked players in the Purim spiel. On my own shelves, I have uh, a few articles that really make me happy. This is a rabbi reading the Torah by Anita Rosenfield was a gift. And this is a, a rabbi Peli. There's another behind Coco Pelli is um, a flute player and jokester of the Southwest, but here made into a rabbi by um, Robert Shields. I really appreciate that. And local artists made various women's um, figurines under a chuppah, and it says Torah, and uh, made it especially for me. I have various Hanukkiot, the dancing women, uh, the trees, um, the glass, so so many different ways, um, uh, houses of uh, of worship, and kind of um, ancient Israelites walking through the desert. I, I use them all at at um, at Hanukkah, and then I have various articles uh, that are just you know fun and that I look at all the time, the Red Rock of Shalom and Hineni, uh, Shofar. Remember Hidur Mitzvah, that we try to make things beautiful and not just, uh, just utilitarian. We want to delight in using these. And so my, my parting question is, what is on your walls? And in our, uh, in our fourth lesson, we shared from our own collections of Judaica and Jewish art from travels and holiday treasures. And I just want to bring uh, a couple here. Most of it, I, I will not not show you this time. I, I'll ask the viewer of this recording to look around your own walls and display cases and see what is a treasure for you. This is uh, a typical Polish silver Kiddush cup from my mother's home in Poland. It was buried in the earth during the war along with six smaller cups. And then uh, it was retrieved by a cousin sent to us and we used it for Shabbat and holidays when my brother and I were children. And then um, by Yitzhak and me with our children when they were growing up. And before Tali, our daughter was married, I gifted her with this cup and two of the smaller cups. We still have four in our home and we call it the maternal kiddush cup. And I always thought that if I would have to grab something precious and leave the house, this would be the thing that I would take that has the most meaning to me. 
Um, so I'm going to end with this and stop the share and just say, let's treasure our treasures. Let's um, bring Judaica to a high art, appreciate Jewish artists, um, buy their art, put it on our walls, tell the story and realize that everything we do to enhance the commandment at our holidays, at our Shabbats, as we do a mitzvah, is Hidur mitzvah, is enhancing the commandment. And that's in the physical world. But in the emotional and spiritual world, it's also meditating with kavanah, with intention, praying, learning. All of that is a way to enhance the commandments of the huge tradition that we have received throughout the ages. So I say shalom to all of you. Thank you for watching. And I hope that this will inspire you to make art, create art, appreciate art, and carry on our traditions. Shalom.